I'm going to talk to you very quickly um, and really just give you a little bit of background uh, about this topic. Now, I know many of you are already involved in this field and are doing a lot of really good work, um, and I hope that some of these data reflect that. Now, just looking at, uh, at boring stuff first, smoking prevalence, it's never very exciting. Um, you can see a decline there. It's not as fast as we'd like it. So we're about one in five at the moment, um, New Zealand adults smoking. Okay, so we'd like to see that a little bit lower. You know, 3% I could probably live with. Um, this is still too high. 3% perhaps is around about what you might see with smoking prevalence in doctors. Smoking prevalence in nurses, but higher. Now, uh, start with this premise. Actually, most smokers don't want to continue to smoke. These are data from the New Zealand Tobacco Use Survey. So you can see here that if you ask smokers, about 80% of them say, look, if I had my time over, I would never, ever, ever have started. And you often hear it still with, you know, uh, doctors usually. Oh, well, it's their choice. They made that choice. They've got to do something about it if they want to. And I still see the smoking lifestyle choice. I was just reviewing some questionnaires um, recently which talked about smoking um, and uh, other drugs of dependence as lifestyle choices. It may have been a choice initially, but that choice is very quickly taken away when it becomes an addiction. Um, and, and that's what we're dealing with here. Um, if you're looking at quit attempts, 60% are tried in the last five years. And five years is a relatively short space of time, and so people are trying to do something about it. Now, what are we up against? Well, of course, we're up against the addictive nature of tobacco itself. Uh, and this all varies. You know, there's big genetic variation to how quickly we become addicted to things. Some people don't. Hands up, those of you who have smoked but never went on to have more than that one or two puffs. A few of you. How many of you here started smoking quite quickly and got into it really quickly? Yeah, so surprisingly large number, you know, lots of people try, but if the mix is right, off you go. It needs to be a mix of both environmental and genetic, and of course, situations. If you're depressed, if you're in a mental health institution, you're probably much more likely to start smoking. Uh, it's sort of just ingrained in these, these institutions. Um, it's all part of the thing. Tobacco industry. I often forget about this in a sort of clinical role, but they have not gone away. They're still there, they're trying to work out how to sell more of their product. We import most of our cigarettes. We still have one uh, factory in New Zealand in Petone, but otherwise everything else is imported. But they're always trying to find new markets and look at, you know, repackage what they sell, tobacco. And then you've got the over-optimism of the person who smokes themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get around to it soon, or I'll quit before I turn 40, or I'll quit before I get sick. And then, of course, the time comes and it's difficult to quit, um, and uh, so they continue to smoke. Now, tension triggers treatment. I kind of like this. Many of you have heard me speak before. I always go on about it because it wraps everything up. You know, tobacco controls on a spectrum. There's the policy stuff, the health promotion, the tensions, the triggers, the prevention. That needs to continue. On the other end of the spectrum is clinical treatment, i.e. helping those that are already addicted. And that fits with lots of things. Um, take, take heart disease. A lot of stuff that the National Heart Foundation does is preventing heart disease in the first place. But then we still pay for cardiothoracic surgeons to fix the problem of the blocked coronary arteries. So, you know, there's a whole spe spectrum from prevention to treatment, all of those are important. Now, policies can't stop, and you see there are lots of, lots of things on this list um, about, you know, tensions and triggers. Tax is a great tension and a great trigger. And you saw, um, and or may have heard in January when we had a 10% increase in price, Quitline was flooded with calls doesn't always do everything. My dad never stopped smoking with a tax increase. He stopped smoking now because he cut the end of his thumb off. Um, and he got brief advice from an ED doctor who said, your thumb's not going to heal unless you stop smoking. 
And my dad said, oh, you know, you can talk to me about those patches, but they don't work. ED doctor said, well, you're in luck, because if you go and see your GP, they'll be able to help you out with something else. And so dad did, and off he went, and he phoned me, very pleased to say, ah, oh, I've got this gram on Zyban. It's great, how come you never told me about Zyban before? <laughs> Anyway, so, you know, that's always those, those things that happen in, um, in, in families, of, of course. Now, these data here are from the International Tobacco Control Project. So this is a group of countries working together to monitor um, policy and cessation and, and monitor a group or cohort of smokers to map what they're doing. Now, I'm just going to point out one line of this here, and this is making a quit attempt. Now, you can see that if you're a smoker in Canada, Canada has really good tobacco control policies, really strong on policy. You're more likely to make a quit attempt than if you're a smoker in the UK. Now, it's not that the UK doesn't have smoking uh, tobacco, good tobacco policies, but there's also a big push on treatment. So you need the policy, you need the tension and triggers to get people to make a quit attempt. But if you're a smoker in the UK, your odds of quitting are significantly higher than any other country. So this is used as the comparator here, but your odds are greater than all of these other countries, probably because the UK is very treatment focused at the moment. The thing here is you need both. You need tensions, triggers, and treatment. All three put together. Um, now stop smoking services themselves aren't going to have a huge effect on prevalence. And why is that? If I go and set up a, a nice big glossy smokers clinic, you know, over on, in Takapuna, and people come, how much effect on pre local prevalence am I going to have? Well, I will have some effect, but the problem, the problem is that not enough people come through my clinic. Most people still, when they quit smoking, try how? Well, a lot try unaided. Yeah, yeah. Then they'll try something, you know, maybe they'll reduce. Maybe they'll then go to the supermarket and pick up some gum. Then if that, that doesn't work, they'll go to the pharmacy. And then that doesn't work, maybe they'll talk to their nurse. Then if that doesn't work, maybe they'll call the quit line. If that doesn't work, then they might come to my clinic. You know, my clinic is really only for those really hardcore smokers, and I'm not one of those. So, you know, stop smoking services do work, but they don't always have a big effect on prevalence, but they do save people's lives. Remember, for every two smokers, one will die of a smoking-related disease. Stopping smoking works. So, New Zealand smoking cessation guidelines, uh, they're a little old now. Um, they were meant to be updated last year, so they're a little bit overdue, but not a huge amount has changed in, in those times. Um, this is what they recommend, screening, brief advice, um, offer of help, and a combination of behavioral support and pharmacotherapy. So both of those things work best together. And the guidelines sort of wrapped it all up into ABC. Now before ABC, ABC is Ask Brief Advice Cessation Support, I'm sure you've all, everyone's heard of ABC, haven't they? Yeah. A bit hard push not to these days. Before ABC, it was five A's. Ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange. Now this was an American invention, and I was speaking to Richard Hur a couple of weeks ago, and he goes, you know what, we've, we've gone to sort of an ABC. Now Americans are too proud to, of course, adopt other people's uh, mnemonics, so they've gone AAR. <laughs> ask, advise, refer. So um, they're, they're looking at a more simple approach now uh, as well. But this is what it's all about, uh, and combining them all together. Now, I'm going to just talk and touch on the C part of this. And treatment does work. We just don't have any silver bullet. We don't have a treatment that is 99% quit rate sort of stuff but we can increase the chances of quitting above not using anything. Now, I'll explain what this is. So let's start with NRT alone. This would be um, getting a quit card from you when you said, here you go, here's the gum, this is how you use it, good luck. Now, compared to using nothing alone, you'd be increasing their chances somewhere around about one and a half times, okay, just by doing that. So that's NRT alone.
Now, if you said to them, okay, I don't, don't like NRT, I'm going to give you behavioral support, and I'm going to see you weekly for the next four weeks. That's all you did, and you sat them down, and you talked to, talked to them, and you made them feel good, and uh, you're, you're a nice person. You could double their chances of quitting smoking long term. Okay. Now, if you combine, and I'm going to have to point to it here because I'm far too short to that to reach, but if you use behavioral support and one nicotine replacement product, you could roughly triple their chances of quitting compared to nothing alone. If you use behavioral support and two NRT products, here we go, it's more like four times more likely to quit. We should not be using single NRT products anymore despite what Pharmac letters might say. <laughs> um, and then you've got the other medications here. Here's behavioral support and varenicline, somewhere you know, around fourfold, um, nortriptyline and, and bupropion. So all of these things, pharmacotherapies work best when combined with behavioral support. Now I'm not suggesting that you all have to go out there and buy a sofa and get your clients to lie down on them. Um, there are other people that can provide behavioral support for you. And if you're looking at support in New Zealand, this is sort of the broad context of what we have. Um, the quit line um, provide proactive telephone counselling, at least that's what they used to provide. Uh, and proactive telephone counselling is them calling the client. They have, the client has to make the initial first call and then they say, right, I'm going to give you a call back uh, in a week's time to see how you're doing and then you go on like that. The other type of support is reactive telephone support, and that is not so good. Reactive is, I'll be here if you run into any problems, give me a call. So the best type of telephone support is proactive. The quick group also um, are playing around with some web and text-based support. Um, there's growing evidence that text-based support is, uh, sorry, web-based support is useful. And I've heard through the grapevine from a very large study in the UK that there's some good data coming on text-based support as well. Now, nothing as high as you can get from face-to-face, -face, but these options uh, are there for people that, uh, that want them. Frontline healthcare professionals are getting more involved now in providing behavioral support. Perhaps they've found you know, it's not so difficult or that they've had some interest peaked by doing the online program. And then we've got Pacific Smoking Cessation Services, Okati Kai Piper, there are some pregnancy services, DHBs also have services, PHOs have services now that are providing either individual or group-based counselling. Looking at pharmacotherapy, we have all effective treatments available and subsidised now. Um, we don't have all nicotine replacement therapies that are available here subsidized, but patch gum and lozenge are. The microtab and inhaler are available in pharmacies. Nortriptyline is funded, in our, those NRT products are funded, bupropion or Zyban is funded, and varenicline or Champix is funded subject to special authority criteria. So not everyone can get Champix. Now do I have a... Um, I'll have a slide in a minute which will just go over those um, special authority criteria.